two questions jumped out at me almost immediately when I read John 6, 30 to 40. And they demonstrate my propensity to make everything about me or about us, even when it's not. The, the first question that jumped out to me is, why would Jesus not just give us the bread if we ask nicely? Like when my kids ask rudely, I don't want to give them anything. But when they ask nice, you kind of want to give them stuff. And then the second question is, when Jesus starts talking about like who's lost and who he, who, he, who he won't lose and who's been given to him, is he saying that not everybody is part of his flock? And if he's saying that, how do I know that I am? And those are two questions that come from the text. But the thing is, the passage actually, surprisingly, isn't about us, but about Jesus. It begins, they asked him, and in, in asking him, they sound like us. What sign then will you give me? What sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. What are you going to do for me? It doesn't actually say it that way, but that's pretty much what it's saying. This group of people, we have to remember, is literally hungry and thirsty. They live in a difficult time, in a difficult place. They're traveling. There are no restaurants to speak of. They're following this Messiah-like character, something of a new Moses, who they believe literally fed people in the wilderness seven days a week for 40 years straight. They've been fed by Jesus once, and now they want him to do the very simple thing of pick up the Moses-sized plate and feed the people. They're hungry. They're not stupid people. And they're not people incapable of understanding metaphor or bread as metaphor, and yet they are, in fact, hungry. In response, they, Jesus doesn't give them the sign. Based on what we've read about him so far, it sure seems like he could offer a sign. He could just make another loaf of bread. No big deal. But he chooses not to. Why? I mean, it seems to me giving in here would be easiest. And as parents, we know that very often the short-term easy give-in has a long-term cost. Jesus knows that the signs themselves are never going to be enough. He wants followers who love him for who he is, not what he can buy them. People who are devoted to him for who he is, not what he does. He also knows that any materialistic understanding of Moses misses the point. And that's even baked in a scripture of the time. In Deuteronomy, we read, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Even in the Moses story, it was to be understood that the manna, the bread, the material things that we get on offer are secondary. Jesus knows other passages because this didn't just happen with Moses. Later on, you have prophets like Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, he famously, he reads this scroll. He reads, he eats words. And then it gives him something precious to offer others. My point is that the metaphor that the word of God is somehow like food is old by the time Jesus uses it. This isn't news. So fair enough. But if you want to teach a man to fish, you better feed him first, right? Hungry people make terrible students. How many schools have to have breakfast programs? Because we know, even if we want to teach you to fish long term, we better feed you first. If I want you to understand a metaphorical meaning of bread and food and the word of God, I better make sure you're not starving. So that's part of the story. 
Kent Hughes, he's a commentator. He offers this story that I think is pretty helpful. He points us to, in the 1930s, there's this person named William Somerset Maugham. He's a novelist, a playwright, a short story writer. He's probably the most famous living writer in the 30s. His novel of human, on human bondage quickly became a classic. His play, The Constant Wife, had literally thousands of stagings. In 1965, he was 91 years old and fabulously wealthy. He had royalty checks pouring in daily, even though he hadn't written a word in decades. He received about 300 letters a week from fans when he was 91 years old. How did he respond to this? What did all this brought to him, his life? He has a nephew named Robin who visited him at his Mediterranean villa. And this is what the, the, the nephew notices about his, his uncle. He says, I looked around at the drawing room and the immensely valuable furniture and pictures and objects. I remembered the sheer expense of the villa itself and the wonderful garden that I could see through the windows, a fabulous setting on the edge of the Mediterranean. Willie had 11 servants including a cook named Annette, who was the envy of all the other millionaires on the Riviera. He dined on silver plates, waited on by his butler and his footman. You're talking about one guy needs two people to bring him dinner. And they're not even the people who cooked it. It's taken three people to make this one guy a meal, right? You know you made it when you have three people cooking for you at the same time. But it no longer meant anything to him. One afternoon, I found Willie reclining on a sofa with a Bible, which had very large print. He looked horribly wizened. His face was grim. He looked up at me. I've been reading the Bible you gave me. And I've come across the quotation, what shall a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I must tell you, my dear Robin, that this text used to hang opposite to my bed when I was a child. And of course, it's all bunk. But the thought of it is quite interesting all the same. That evening after dinner, Willie flung himself down on the sofa. Oh, Robin, I'm so tired. He gave a gulp and buried his head in his, in his hands. I've been a failure the whole way through my life, he said. I've made mistake after mistake. I've made a hash of everything. I tried to comfort him. I said, you're the most famous writer alive. Surely that means something. I wish I'd never written a single word, he answered. It's brought me nothing but misery. Everyone who's got to know me has ended up by hating me. My whole life has been a failure, and now it's too late to change. It's too late. And he looked up, and he tightened his grip. He was staring towards the floor, his face contorted with fear and trembling violently. Willie, face ashen, stares in horror straight ahead. Suddenly it starts shrieking, go away, I'm not ready, I'm not dead yet, I'm not dead yet, I tell you. His high-pitched, terror-struck voice seemed an echo from wall to wall. I looked around the room, but there was empty. There's no one here, Willie, I said. But Willie began to gasp hysterically. Mom is one of the most famous and fated men of his generation. A man who has everything, not just wealth, but fame. Fan letters pouring in. A man who dined with princes. But when it came to the time of reckoning, he found life empty and worthless, and he was afraid to die. That is not the life God intended for us. God does not want anybody to get to the end of life and think it's all been futility and mistakes. Mom learned a lesson that is difficult to learn and one that Jesus knew that many, many, many people are going to have to learn. Bread and water are important in life, but if you want Jesus to just be like Moses and provide literal food to a small group of people, you don't understand the scope of his work. He says in the story, I have come for the world, not just for Israel. I have come for eternal purposes, not just for lunch. And that's at least part of the story we have to understand here. Material wealth is not all it's cracked up to be. And if you're interested in God for material purposes or because he might answer your prayers, you're missing the boat. 
It's a common theme in the Bible. We read over and over again lines like, the word of God is more precious than rubies and Teslas. I might have added one there. Jesus spoke a great deal about money and generosity and those who understand God's love and how they will be more open-handed, they'll be more generous, they'll be less worried about it. And if that's what you needed reminding of today, consider yourself reminded. But there's more going on here. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the bread from heaven, the true bread from heaven, where the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus doesn't give them the bread they ask for. He corrects their misunderstanding of their own story. You see that? They're like, hey, Moses did this for us back in the day. We know it. We've read it. We've done this Passover thing every year, our whole lives. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're doing it wrong. No, the credit, he says, goes to God. And he's about to reveal the even bigger truth, right? He's about to say, I am exponentially more important than Moses could ever be. And I don't even have to give you bread for that to be true. This kind of stuff makes me nervous about what Jesus would say if he came and saw his churches today. But we'll move from that. The people don't get it. They echo Nicodemus. They echo the woman at the well. This is John building patterns into his gospel story. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. They're still talking about food. I would say they're still hungry, so fair enough. Jesus responds. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. There's a commentator that helps us here, Merrill Tinney. And they say the assertion, I am the bread of life, is the first of a series of declarations. We're going to work through them as we go through John. There's actually seven. Uh, they're peculiar to the Gospel of John, and they represent Jesus' specific relationship to spiritual needs. So he talks about their light in the darkness, their entrance into security and fellowship, their guide and their protector in life, their hope in death, their certainty in perplexity, and their source for vitality, for productiveness. He desired that we should receive him not simply for what he might give us, but for what he might be to us, which is different. By showing that the manna was a gift from God, Jesus argues that the proper comparison is not between Moses and himself as wonder workers. Richard Manley Jr. says it this way, but rather between manna and himself as the provision from God. Since you think I'm like Moses... I can bring you bread. What you don't get is that I'm the manna. I am what God is sending you for your well-being. And that's pretty confusing. So I don't blame the people who don't get it and they're still hungry. I would be getting pretty fed up if I was the people that was hungry and Jesus kept talking without giving me food. I remember going to school and waiting for recess because I needed an apple. But what Jesus does next is not give them the apple. He just makes it even more bizarre. He says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. I shall not lose one he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. The hint here is that not everyone is given to him, but only the people the Father gives to him, which sounds pretty limiting. And what if we're not among them? This is where the history of Israel comes in. The name Israel means he who struggled with God. I find that helpful because passages like this require struggle. Often they require humble acceptance that on our part, we might as well admit it, we're not going to have all the answers. We're not going to dot all the I's. We're not going to cross all the T's. We're going to have to move on. The best I can figure it is that not everybody will desire to come into the kingdom. All those who do desire it will not be rejected. Jesus says, I won't reject them. But somehow not everybody will want to accept these. And why that is, is pretty hard to know. And why that is, people have literally killed each other over. 
Is it just because God says, I only pick these people and I will harden all the other hearts? Is there an extent to which you must be willing to accept it in order to accept it? But if you have to be willing to accept it, it's not grace because now you're doing something to earn it. And on and on we go. You can see how this gets really fraught really, really quickly. And I suppose the best answer, this is maybe a cop out. My best answer is put it on the list of stuff to ask Jesus once you meet him later. But what can we take from it now? The main element, I think, and it always comes back to this, is grace. When Jesus talks about this will from God and Jesus' own role in making sure he doesn't lose anybody, he's talking about the givenness of the bread. The people do not earn the bread of life. He simply is the bread of life. And we get this wrong all the time, and we've done this for ages. C.S. Lewis has a great passage about how we get this wrong. I'm going to read it to you. It's a bit long, but it's great. Niceness, wholesome, integrated personality is an excellent thing. We must try to, by every medical, educational, economic, and political means in our power to produce a world with as many people as possible grow up nice. Just as we must try to produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeeded in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people content in their own niceness, looking no further turned away from God would be just as desperately in need of salvation as the miserable world and might even be more difficult to save, right? Because if they're all nice and everything's going well, it doesn't seem like you need the help. Mere improvement is not redemption, though redemption always improves people even here and now and will, in the end, improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. And of course, recognize that when C.S. Lewis is writing, he's using very masculine terms, but ladies, you're included in this. It's not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but turning a horse into a winged creature, says Lewis. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences which could not have been jumped over and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. The objective for us is not to earn the bread, not to get nice enough to earn the bread, but to accept the bread or the wings. The crux of the saying here is that just as Jesus could feed the people in his hillside picnic, just as God fed the people that were with Moses in the desert for 40 years, so too, each of us are invited to accept the meal on offer. And it's a spiritual meal. Accepting it does not mean you will drive a Tesla next week. Kent Hughes says you don't even want to drive the Tesla. He doesn't actually say that. What he says is, apart from Christ, nothing satisfies. The best of fishing trips must be followed by another fishing trip. The most exquisite meal still leaves you hungry. You can never find a cup of tea big enough or a book that is long enough. You can play the best racquetball game in your life, be at your best, but it better be followed by another. You have a great Sunday dinner and it has to be followed by a big breakfast in the morning. You can wear the fanciest, most chic clothes, but you're going to have to buy new clothes next year. All of these things are like the proverbial Chinese dinner. In a few hours, you'll be empty and ready to eat again. It's the way that Somerset mom dressed in his finest tuxedo night after night, playing cards with some of the most famous people in the world, with dukes and duchesses who are seeking his favor. And yet, while he's at the most exclusive parties in the world, he finds no lasting satisfaction. Jesus knew that looking for satisfaction in the wrong places is what we would do. We did it back then, and we do it now. He also knew that he was the divine one. He's the one Isaiah talked about. He's the one the Old Testament talks about. So Isaiah wrote this. We're almost done. Come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. 
Why spend money on what is not bread and labor on what will not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. The focus on the passage is not why doesn't God answer all of our prayers, nor the question of who's in and who's out, though you can find books that say otherwise. The question is the very character and identity of Jesus as the Christ, as the bread, as the food promised in the Old Testament. And yet we want proof, don't we? What sort of proof could Jesus possibly offer that would have eternal meaning or consequences for any of us? I don't think there's an answer to that because we're all greedy and we all want more. We always forget what Jesus did for us yesterday or last week or five years ago, and we want something more. What do you hunger and thirst for? Patience, justice, healing, relationships, reconciliation, work, financial security, peace in your soul, or simply more. Whatever it is, what Jesus is talking about here is his ability to fulfill your actual need. In response to all of those, he would say, I am patience, I am justice, I am healing, I am relationships, I am reconciliation, I am a job, I am financial security, I am more. What does it sound like to you that he would react that way when you ask him for something? Ask him to heal somebody and he says, I am healing. You ask him for money to have enough food to get through the month, and he says, I'm the food. Will you accept that? Can you accept that or accept him? He offers this to people 2,000 years ago, a way forward with true bread, and he stands before us again, offering over and over again. He says, I have more to give you than the world has to offer, more than you even know to ask for. Will you reach out your hands and let me put in them what you actually need? Can we accept this offering? I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and be raised on the last day. Can you accept the offering? Let's pray about it. Father, we ask that we would be able to hear what you're telling us. To see what you're offering us. And for those of us who haven't accepted it yet or have accepted it so long ago, we kind of forget about it. Would you help us to accept it, to be humble enough to take what you're giving? Lord, only you can do this. Only you can inspire us to really be your people. Would you do so now, Lord? We ask it in Christ's most powerful name. Amen. Mm -hmm.